Good afternoon, everyone, and thank you for joining us. This is Chris Fryan of Per Central Group, and I'm joined by Chris Brown of Per Central HR, who's going to be leading us through this topic today. Uh, the topic of the day is uh, benefit incentives, ways to motivate your employees. Um, and it's scheduled to run approximately 50 minutes. As always, we will leave some time at the end for any questions, so feel free to enter those as uh, as you have them in the GoToMeeting webinar platform in the questions dialog box. Um, also, we are awaiting approval from the HRCI Institute, so um, we will, once we do get that approval, as always, we'll send that out in an email to any of the attendees of today's webinar. So without further ado, I will turn it over to Chris to get us started for today. Chris? Hi, Chris. Thank you so much for uh for introducing the topic, and it is sort of a different topic today. It's not like one of our, you know, real complicated uh, technical topics that we sometimes do. Um, but uh, I think it's a useful one because when I talk to companies all over the country about, you know, ways that they can better leverage their human capital, one of the things that we often come back to is, is that, you know, if we can motivate our employees, if we can help them become engaged, we almost always see positive results um, in the in the long run. And so, you know, that's something that that is very valuable to businesses and one of the things that you'll find is that it's it's not always just monetary and that's why I, I think we came up with this title which is you know sort of beyond incentives because it's not just about you know can we throw more money at the problem because one of the things that we'll, we'll see as we go through this topic and some of these are things that we've talked about in previous webinars there's always there's always a little bit of a little bit of overlap um, but uh, one of the things that we've talked about in other webinars is that you know there's things that, that are more important to employees than just compensation. Sure, everybody wants to believe that they're being fairly compensated, but the, the other factors sometimes can make a bigger difference than we might otherwise, than we might otherwise expect. And um, so that's one of the things that, you know, we're going to be talking a little bit about in this webinar because, of course, um, you know, you can always pay people more, but we have limited resources. So, besides compensation, what are the things that we can do to um, to help motivate our employees? So, let's look at some of the data here. Um, so, our presumption here, and, and this is backed up by data that I'll be sharing with you, is that a motivated workforce is more productive, and and we see in the research strong correlations with worker uh, motivation, productivity, and financial performance of the firm. Um, so, these are these are positive correlations that have been identified in, you know, numerous studies of organizational behavior and organizational performance. And so when we can, when we can kind of bring all of this together, um, it really, you know, it really can help make a difference in our organization over the long term. Um, the, the next thing is, is that, you know, motivation, it takes more than um, simple incentives. And so, that, you know, sometimes some of the things that we're doing um, are, are counterproductive to motivated employees and sometimes we're doing things that have no effect at all and we're wasting money on programs that don't really make a difference. So really motivating our workforce depends on employee engagement, employee morale, finding the right incentives um, and, and that can be the tough part is finding the right incentives um, because some companies like I say are spending a lot on things that maybe don't matter that much to employees. Um, you know we might have invested tremendously in, you know, really expensive health plan and, and you know, if we have a, a younger workforce that, that doesn't see that as being a huge benefit, then perhaps some of those dollars would be better spent on other other ways of motivating our employees. This is one of the studies that I mentioned earlier, which is this just looked at operating margins of companies that were grouped into either high engagement or low engagement as far as their workers. And so what we see is that highly engaged firms on average uh, had higher operating margins than those firms with low employee engagement. And so this is why employee engagement is such a key port, part of, of leveraging human capital and it is, becomes really important when motivated the employees because we see that when we have a more engaged workforce, we have a more motivated workforce, and when we have a more motivated workforce, we um, see financial incentives to the firm and ultimately to the workers as well. They need to share in that. Um, one of the things, though, that's, that's tough for employers is that we have multi-generational workforces now. 
and not all generations are created equally when it comes to job satisfaction. So um, they're, one of the things that has, has been demonstrated over the past decade is that middle-aged workers in particular um, can have the highest dissatisfaction levels and be the most difficult to motivate. This is challenging because in a lot of firms we are made up primarily of middle-aged workers. Um, now, I always get a little nervous when I tell people things like this because then they think that I've got some idea that they should just go out and hire a bunch of you know brand new college graduates and fire all their employees, and that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is, is that we just need to be creative in how we engage and motivate that, that section of the workforce. And, and here's a graphic. Of, I've used it in some other webinars. I think it's a fascinating, a fascinating thing because it's, it's, it's interesting because if we look at this curve, so I mean this was normalized at zero. So they took all the respondents and they came up with a mean at zero for job satisfaction, all right? Um, across all these different age groups. And so, you know, we've got way out here, the GI, um, uh, silent generation, um, you know, all these groups here. Out here we have the millennials. Most of our workforce, though, is comprised of these folks in the middle, uh, the boomers, um, younger generation X. Um, this is the bulk of our workforce. And what we see is, is that the bulk of our workforce um, is to a significant degree, when, when you consider the fact this was normalized, to a significant degree less satisfied with their jobs than the folks out here on the ends. And so if we were kind of designing a perfect workforce from a different demographic standpoint, which of course would be illegal to do, um, but if we were, we might just want to cut these guys right out and just focus upon older workers and younger workers because they tend to find more satisfaction from their jobs and that's something that can be very helpful to a firm. Uh, the reality is is that you know a lot of our workforce is right here in the middle and we can't just ignore those people. We need to find ways of engaging and motivating those workers uh, because they do have valuable skills. They are an important part of the workforce and it would be illegal to just you know decide not to hire them. <laughs> so you know important things. When we look at why people find their job satisfying. And once again, job satisfaction is a key part of worker motivation. It's very difficult to motivate workers if they do not find their job to be satisfying. And um, we're going to talk a little bit about worker motivation here in a moment, but what are the things that make people satisfied with their job? You know, what are the, what are the elements of that? And, you know, there's a number of things. I mean, job security is huge. You know, and, and you can never discount job security. Um, this is a study in 2011. It was done by Sharm. It's a, it's a good study, but I mean, we, we, we shouldn't ever discount job, set, job security. I mean, people, if they feel that their job is always in jeopardy, are not going to be satisfied. They're going to be extremely difficult to motivate. They are not going to think of what is in the long-term interest of the organization because they do not believe that they have a long-term future in the organization. And so promoting job security is very valuable for creating a highly motivated workforce. Some companies go about this in different ways. Um, some companies will, will say a lot of things to their companies, to, to their employees, to make them feel that their jobs are secure. We have to be really careful about that because we want employees to feel secure in their jobs, but we don't want to make promises to them that their jobs are secure. Um, when we do handbook reviews, you know, it's not that uncommon that we'll see statements early on in the handbook that you know, more or less <laughs> promise employees perpetual employment. And that's not a promise that we can really back up because circumstances do change. So you know, there's always a degree of insecurity in any job, but to the extent that we can make employees feel secure in their jobs, we're going to, to have a more satisfied workforce, which can lead to a more um, motivated workforce if we do that correctly. Um, I want to look at some of the other things, though, that are on here. Um, look at this, opportunities to use skills and abilities. Look at how high that is. That is higher than compensation. And I think that's, sorry, compensation. And that's one of the things that, that I, I point out to companies all the time. Some companies are so focused on, you know, how can we be as competitive as we can be from a pay standpoint, which is important. We're going to have a hard time attracting good workers if we don't offer competitive pay. But the funny thing is, in this survey, the employees 
found that using their skills and abilities to create more job satisfaction than the pay itself. And so one of the things that a lot of companies do that is counterproductive is that they have employees who, who could do more, who, who could develop their abilities, who could contribute more to the organization. They don't find ways of, of harnessing that and using it, and, and that's a big mistake because those employees get burnt out in those jobs, they aren't satisfied, they aren't motivated, and they don't create the same benefit to the organization that they would if we were allowing them to, to use their skills and abilities effectively. Not only that, but it's, it's better for the organization as well. So I really like to point that one out because, you know, people think, oh, it's always pay. Pay is the thing that's the top. No, it's not. Job security and being able to use our, our skills are the two things that are most important. Pay is important, but it's not the most important. And I think that's um, some thing that some companies miss when they're trying to figure out how to, to have a, a highly motivated workforce is that they forget that sometimes it's the less tangible stuff um, that matters more to workers than just, you know, how much are they getting paid. Um, so important. One of the things that we see that's becoming increasingly important in having a, a satisfied, motivated workforce is work-life balance, um, particularly for younger workers. Um, now, I think all workers can benefit from improved work-life balance. So I'm not saying that you know older workers don't care at all about this, but if, when we do surveys of younger workers, to them they've seen um, their their family. You know they were raised in homes where both parents worked worked a lot of hours, and they saw how it, it maybe negatively impacted their home life. And because of that, to them having good work-life balance is more more important than it is often to those folks that are in, in, in the middle ages. And so one of the things that companies have to do, you know, as we bring more of these younger workers into the workforce is implement programs that help promote, uh, you know, a good work-life balance so that people don't feel like they're married to their jobs. Um, you know, they want to have jobs that are meaningful, they want to have jobs that are important. Um, and they want to make good money, but they want to also be able to have a life outside of work. And that's something that, that today's workers are, are, are much more concerned about than workers, workers in the past. Workers in the past were, you know, in general, much more concerned about, you know, compensation and benefits, which are still important. Don't get me wrong. Those are still important things. But um, younger workers, they, they, some of that intangible, intangible stuff is, is more important than, you know, just the compensation and benefits. And um, also, and this is tough because it's not easy to move every business, but where your business is located can have a big impact on the satisfaction of your employees. If you are located in an area where there's a lot of activities, where there are a lot of things for employees to do, um, it's easier to have a, a satisfied um, uh, and motivated workforce. And one of the other things that they find in the research is that many uh, individuals will accept lower salaries in exchange for work flexibility. And we're going to come back to that later, is that one of the, the key sort of cost-neutral benefits that many companies can provide is flexible scheduling. Um, so back in the 60s, uh, a fellow named Douglas McGregor uh, from MIT Sloan, I don't know if it was called Sloan then, but from MIT Sloan came up with these two theories of worker motivation. So theory X is, is kind of the way a lot of managers have traditionally approached their employees. And it kind of goes like this. So the average person um, doesn't like work. And they're not going to work if they can avoid it. All right? So if, if, they can, if they can avoid work, they're going to avoid work. So if they can get away with doing the least amount possible, if they can skip out of work, if they can slack off, disappear, that's what they're going to do. Because they don't like work, we have to, you know, coerce them, control them, direct them, use punishment. We have to do things to force people into meeting organizational objectives. This is the way a lot of managers still act. This is an old theory, but a lot of managers still approach their workforce this way. And so because of this, the average human being prefers to be directed, they want to avoid responsibility, and they have relatively little ambition, and all they want is, is job security. That's all they care about. And, and a portion of that is true, because as we saw in the other research, job security is important. Theory Y, though, is sort of the newer way of managing employees. I mean, it, it, it's not that new. I mean, these theories came out in the 60s, but you really didn't see companies 
really start to implement this for decades. Um, and that is that the you know physical and mental work is is natural. People are going to do it. So whether they're at home, whether they're at work, whether they're at play, they're going to do stuff. Okay, humans aren't just going to lay around all day in you know a pool of sweat waiting for someone to feed them. Um, this external control and and punishment, the punitive stuff that companies did for so long, um, is not the only way of bringing about organizational objectives. In fact, in a lot of workers, it can be counterproductive. Um, so if we can get employees to be committed, they will use self-direction and self-control to help meet these organizational objectives. Commitment to the objectives is a function of the rewards associated with their achievement. So we have to have rewards that align with what objectives we want employees to accomplish. And this is where, you know, and there's nothing we can do about this, but this is where, for example, you know, paying by the hour for work is, is something that in a lot of ways is counterproductive to achieving organizational objectives because if you're just paying someone for being there for an hour, that doesn't necessarily motivate them to, to create whatever the outcome is that, you, that you're striving for. Now, we don't have any choice about that. We have to pay people by the hour unless they're exempt or outside sales or something like that, but we can create other incentives that go beyond just the hourly pay some of which are going to have a cost, some of which aren't going to have a cost, so that they will that they will see that their efforts um, create some reward and they're incentivized to meet organizational objectives. The average person will not only accept but seek out more responsibility if we create the environment where where that will happen. And so one of the things that we see in more effective organizations is that we encourage responsibility. We encourage a degree of risk taking. We encourage entrepreneurialism. Um, and we talked a little bit about this in, in last month's webinar. It's kind of ironic that we kind of did two very similar topics back to back. But, you know, there's a big, there, there's a whole industry now devoted to helping workers feel empowered and enabled and part of of the the organization in a way that just goes beyond punching the time clock. That they're directly contributing and that their opinions matter. And when we do that, they're going to seek out more responsibility. Um, the capacity to exercise a high degree of imagination, ingenuity, and creativity in the solution of organizational problems is widely distributed. Um, we just have to find ways of fostering that. A lot of a lot of managers and supervisors assume that, you know, their employees are just sort of replaceable drones. You know, well we can take out one drone and put in another drone and it doesn't really make any difference. The reality is, is that, you know, people are capable of much more. We just have to um, find ways of, of enabling that. And under the conditions of modern industrial life, we're doing a really crappy job of this. And this was back in the 60s. Things have changed dramatically since the 60s. But we're only partly utilizing the, the capabilities of our workers. And that's one of the things that more profitable firms often do better, is that they better leverage that human capital. It's a hard thing to do, though. So when we look at what are some of the ways that we can motivate people, one of the things that, that often comes up is benefits. You know, I mean, companies spend a lot of money on benefits. Um, oftentimes after payroll, for many firms, it's their single highest cost. Um, so, you know, this is this is a big deal. So. If we look at the this research by Sherm back in 2011, you know, not surprisingly, 64% wanted health care benefits. So that's a big deal. That's probably shifted a little bit over the past couple of years as, you know, individual coverage has become more widely available, but still important. But look at the other thing here, pay time off. More important than, like, retirement plans is pay time off. And a lot of companies, they get really hung up on, you know, well, we only want to give people a week off or two weeks off or whatever the case might be. And what you've seen over the past couple of years is there's been a shift where, particularly in tech, but other types of businesses, where they're creating more and more flexibility so that employees can be outside of the office. And this won't work in all jobs. I mean, if you've got an assembly line, you need people there running the assembly line. But if your job permits it, creating more time off um, is one of the things that matters the most to workers, so it's it's very important. And we've talked about this before, but I kind of call it esoteric benefits. But 
there, one of the things that a lot of companies have found is that one of the ways of motivating and creating a more engaged workforce is making work a fun place to be. Um, not always an easy thing to do, but you know, if we look at, at companies, what are some of the things that they've done? Well, you know, one of the big ones that a lot of companies have done is they started providing meals. Uh, there's a fellow I just met recently that has a catering company, and he's shifted his catering business is now a huge part of it is providing on-site meals for companies, not necessarily every day, but having these kinds of, of, of benefits doesn't cost a lot. I mean, he was telling me that on average it's less than 10 bucks per employee for them to come out and provide a meal to these workers. But what a huge morale booster for employees, particularly during busy times of year. Having on-site recreation, there's a company we, uh, we met with recently. It's a technology company, but you know, they have a, their employees like set up a, a stage and brought in their instruments and you know that was something that they really enjoyed and um, really helped. Uh, there are some companies now, this is actually a trailer, this is an on-site trailer, or that this, um, somebody brings an on-site salon so employees can get haircuts at work. Once again, not an expensive benefit. You're not paying a lot for this, but something that employees really like. And then, of course, we companies with large campuses now, you know, providing bicycles and ways of getting around is big too. Then there's also little things that that can make a big difference. Uh, one of the ones that that has been shown to make a big difference is to have collaborative workspaces. And I think we got this out of a catalog for a furniture company. So this is, you know, I'm not trying to push this furniture, but getting people out of offices, um, getting people out of high-walled. Um, cubicles where they're isolated and away from each other can have a big boost on employee morale. And um, so, you know, uh, I know Michael Bloomberg is not an uncontroversial figure. There are certainly people who don't like him. But one of the things that he did when he became mayor is he kind of restructured City Hall so that it was this kind of a, a layout. And he was basically in the middle instead of in the formal mayor's office so that, you know, the entire team was engaged and working together. This makes a huge difference to employee morale, makes a huge difference to employee engagement. And this is where we see profitable firms heading. You just don't see companies building, you know, corridors and corridors of offices anymore because we found that it's counterproductive to organizational objectives. We want an engaged workforce. We want people to be motivated and getting them out into the open where they're working with other people, uh, where they feel connected, where they can collaborate. Um, makes just a really big difference. Um, uh, on-site re on recreational activities is huge. I know we kind of already talked about this, but you know, the break room should not be a dim, depressing place, okay? Now, you don't have to get a ping pong table or, but, or foosball or whatever the case might be, but you might try it. I mean, it's the, the ability of employees to go and truly relax for their 15 minute break and not just sit in some dimly lit depressing room um, where they drink a cup of coffee or whatever the case might be has shown to have a huge impact. That 15 minute break when people actually go and do something enjoyable, when they come back to work, they're more motivated, they're more relaxed, they're more mentally acute, um, in tune, and so, huge difference. I mean, if I were designing a new office building, which is not my job, I would have a huge, a huge break room because, and I would have, have it be bright, engaging, have things for employees to do, make it a place where employees could congregate and have a good time, um, because we've shown that, that that little bit of relaxation has a huge impact on the productivity the rest of the day. And so this is, this is huge. Um, and it's something that even a small firm can do, you know, spruce that place up. Uh, there's all sorts of little things you can do. I really thought this was neat. This is a company that provides, you know, healthy meals and snacks to, um, to firms. Um, and it's a really cool idea of, you know, once again, just part of that making employees feel valued. You know, if we can do these little things. I mean, you know, what is a a carton of apples cost. You know, I can't imagine it costs that much. But I mean, that you know, if that makes the employees feel a little bit better. Makes it feel like their company cares about them. They're going to be more motivated. They're going to be more engaged. And it's not an expensive thing to do. 
I'm, I'm not trying to get you guys to blow a ton of money on stuff, but, you know, it's sometimes these small things. Let people work outside. If, if you live in a climate that it works and you've got an area where they can do it, let them work outside. Sunlight has a huge impact on people's mood, um, and the research has shown that giving people the ability to get out of a, you know, their, their you know, dimly lit cubicle or brightly lit cubicle or whatever it might be um, can have a huge impact on the mood um, and motivation of, of employees. So here we've got just a bunch of low cost, not a bunch, but the, the, this list that we pulled this from was actually, it just came out the other day, so it's, it's um, it, it was on HR World, it's 25 ways to reward employees. I only took the ones I liked. Like some of them I thought were goofy. Some of them were interesting. You might think some of the ones that I liked are goofy. Flexible hours. We talked about this earlier. Um, giving employees some flexibility in when they start their shift, when they end their shift, maybe working longer one day, shorter another day. We can't do comp time. Comp time is not legal. We can't have employees work 30 hours one week and make it up the next week. Um, you know, that's not legal. I mean, we can let them work 30 hours one week, but then if they work 50 the next week, we have to pay them overtime. But we can give them flexibility within the work week to adjust when their shift starts, when it ends, what days they work. It doesn't work for all firms, but to the extent that it does, really helps with employee engagement, really helps um, employees uh, feel like they're valued by the firm and uh, therefore become more motivated. Handwritten notes. This is one I've seen over and over in like, the, the million management books that I've read. Um, no, and the, and handwritten, I think the, the handwriting part maybe is overemphasized, but just a personal email from somebody high up in the organization when somebody does a good job can have a huge impact on employee motivation. One of the biggest problems that we see in employees, employers that have low engagement, poor performing employees, is the employees just don't think that anyone cares. They think that if they moved the, you know, the sun, the earth, and the stars and did an amazing job, nobody would even notice. Um, and noticing can make a huge difference. Noticing and acknowledging can make a huge difference. It's also good if we reward um, that when somebody does a great job, but at a minimum, we should notice and acknowledge. Do weekly events to boost morale. I think that's where, like, this catering guy has found a great niche of going out to these companies and, you know, doing meals on a certain day of the week or something like that with different themes. Really awesome feedback from the employees is not hugely expensive. There's other things you could do to boost morale. Make sure it's voluntary. Don't force people into doing goofy activities that they may not be comfortable with. But I'm telling you what, feeding people seems to always make them happy. And if you can get, you know, good healthy food in there that people want to eat, um, getting the whole team together can really, can really help improve employee engagement. Um, help your employees connect. And what we're talking about here is, like, sometimes companies want to guard every, all the real external relationships to where you've got all these people working on the inside. They don't know who the suppliers are. They don't know who the customers are. They never get to talk to anybody outside of the organization. Introduce them. It doesn't hurt to say, hey, you know, this is our, our supplier, this is our customer. You know, bring some of those service people out on appointments from time to time so they can meet the, the people that they're doing the work for. Uh, can make a huge difference. I thought this one was really interesting. That's why we put it in here. <laughs> this is not going to work in most companies. I'm just going to throw that one out there. It's not going to work in most companies. But, you know, if you're in an office environment and you can give some people some flexibility to, like, take off their shoes, um, I think that's awesome. You know, I think that's a, a neat idea that a few companies have done. And, you know, obviously in some environments that's just not going to work, but I thought that was really cool. Um, reward people with days off. Um, if somebody does a great job, maybe you can't really give them a huge bonus, but you can give them a, a ticket for a day off. You know, that extra paid day off, you know, it's money you would have spent on wages anyway. Um, and the, it's a really great way of rewarding the employee. Um, and I think it's a, a, a really uh, useful tool that doesn't increase cost to the company in most circumstances, assuming that you've got some flexibility with you know, when work is done and how it's assigned. Um, let employees swap projects from time to time. Research has shown over and over again that if you make somebody just keep doing the same old thing, they get burnt out. Uh, let them change up their jobs a little bit. You know, let somebody who normally works in the office work in production for a while if there's a job that they can do. Um, 
these are things that, that we've seen really successful companies do, um, and it does greatly increase employee morale. Um, make sure employees know who's done a great job. Don't just have an employee of the month. Have, have a place where you can like, you know, permanently or at least for the long term display the accomplishments of your employees so that they walk past that and feel a sense of pride and realize that the organization has noticed and cares about what they're doing. That's going to help motivate them. Give them a place for relaxing regrouping. I was in a bank uh, not that long ago that had these relaxation chambers. They looked like giant eggs, but basically like it was like a reclining seat that people could go in and it closed up and uh, I think it played music and you know, the break room idea is great for some employees who want to do something fun, but some people just want to relax. Give them the opportunity to do that. When you're requiring employees to full extra hours because it's a big project, whether it's tax season or whatever it is, help them keep their home life together. Do things that, that help them, and, and so I thought this was a really neat idea. You know, a, a company had, you know, it had a, a long night. They, they had a florist bring in a whole bunch of bouquets for the employees to bring home to their spouses. Um, sure, it costs a little bit of money, but what a difference to the employees and their spouses, and it's going to make them feel better about their job and that they're appreciated. And that's the big things. And then just, you know, thank employees. Yeah, we're giving them a paycheck. Yeah, we're giving them benefits. But actually thanking them for their efforts. Um, sometimes can mean a lot more than just paychecks and, and benefits. And so these are, these are all really good morale boosters. Um, uh, this is a, a thing I just saw um, just uh, the other day. It came out in 2012, but I hadn't seen it until uh, uh, recently. Um, the, uh, uh, this is how employees um, ranked the engagement efforts of their employers. So what did employees think mattered? Um, so not surprisingly, you know, giving bonuses, <laughs> employees like that, you know, they're always going to like more money, but there's only so much money to go around. But let's look at some of these other things. Uh, providing a comfortable and stimulating work environment, 30%. I'm surprised it isn't higher than that. I mean, it's amazing the difference that a comfortable and stimulating work environment can make. Um, encouraging employees to share their ideas and opinions. Uh, and investing in employees' careers through through training, professional development, and continuing education. One of the best ways of of really improving your workforce over the long term is providing additional education and training opportunities for your employees. The employees appreciate it, and it's going to pay off for you because of the new skills and abilities that they're going to bring back to the to the workplace. Um, having a formal system in place to recognize reward top employees. Like I said, it shouldn't just be employee of the month. It should be a wall, you know, an entire wall where we put up the accomplishments. You know, this was the brilliant idea from this employee that saved us, you know, $100,000. This was the sale that we made that, you know, helped us get that new product line launch. These are the things that, that should constantly be remembered. Um, and sure, you may not be able to keep it up all forever, but keep it up as long as you can so that it reminds employees that one who made those accomplishments that it was appreciated and also lets other employees see that when they can that, that when they accomplish something it's going to be appreciated and noted as well. So I thought that was really interesting. And the whole the whole study on employee engagement from the, from that this came from was, was really good as well. So I'd encourage you to go and look at that. Um, one of the things that we focused on a lot the past couple years is corporate social responsibility as a way of engaging and motivating our workers. And uh, I've done this with some some really large companies, and, and um, one of the things that we found is that it's one of the things that when we interview employees, they just talk about it all the time, about, oh, our company does this to help the community, our company does this, and, and so these are, are really, really good ways, motivators uh, for employees. So 53% of workers in this today from 2012, it's probably gone up since then, want a job where they can make an impact. Uh, when we look at younger people, that rises to 72%. So as you're hiring more people out of college, they want to work somewhere that makes a difference, okay? And there are lots of ways that we can structure that. But making a difference is huge. Uh, when we go all the way to high school students, it's even higher, 80%. And so the, the people entering the workforce over the next decades, they don't just want a job with a paycheck. They want a job where they feel valued, where they're engaged, 
where they feel like what they do matters, that they work for a company that's doing something good, you know, and you might say, oh, well, my company just makes, you know, brake pads, you know, what's, I don't know, whatever. How, so do other things. You know, you could build a habitat house. You could, you know, there's things that you could do besides just your product because not all of us can make products that are going to be, you know, real exciting. And in this study that was done around the same time, um, these that we asked, what were people willing to take a 15% pay cut for? 35% said they would take a 15% pay cut to work for a company that was committed to corporate social responsibility. So, so when you're when you're promoting your company and trying to attract workers, having a good CSR program can have such a huge impact on your ability to recruit. I mean, you can pay people less because you're doing something good. 45% would do a job, would uh, prefer, would take a pay cut for a job that made a good social and environmental impact, and 58% would like to work for an organization with values like their own. And so if we look at some of these really hot companies right now that are really performing well, you'll see that they're heavily engaged in corporate social responsibility. This is not just something that's for big companies. Small companies can do CSR too, and it can have a big impact um, on recruiting. This was just another study. I'm not really going to focus a lot on this. I've, I've used it before, um, but you know, when when we had employees and we were talking about the things that mattered, once again, mattered to them. These were young employees entering the workforce. Um, you know, what are the things that we got a high response on? Um, you know, advancement is good, but they want to work with good people. They want supervisors who aren't jerks. They want training opportunities. They want good work-life balance. Okay, initial salaries all the way down here. So of all the things these guys cared about, salary was important, but it was not the most important. Look how low opportunity to travel is. I mean, that used to be the big one. Also has one of the highest standard deviations. So people are all over the place on it. But it used to be a big one is that you know, oh well, you can travel with our company. Eh, people are becoming more homebodies. They want a job that they enjoy there, not one that you know occasionally lets them travel somewhere. So, and we're getting close to wrapping up. I kind of knew this one was going to go a little fast. Um, so what are some high involvement work practices? And, and this is something that we've, we've talked about before. But um, so the first big one is power. Uh, information, knowledge, rewards, and what are these, what do these things mean? What are these, how do we implement these? So power is giving people the ability to make decisions that affect their performance and the quality of their working life. So flexible scheduling, huge. Ability to modify work areas. Um, you know, if, if you make people all work in identical little cubes and they don't get any say in how it's decorated or, you know, anything, it's depressing. You know, I worked for a company like that. And it was a, it was a really cool company, but I wasn't allowed to even leave pictures out on my desk at night, you know. That doesn't make you want to go to work. Um, having employee forums where employees can express their concerns and talk about, you know, how to improve working conditions um, can be can really uh, can be really big. Um, giving control over workflow, you know, how how employees uh, get their jobs done, that can that give them a huge feeling of power. Information. This one is huge. We talked a lot about this. Um, uh, last month when we talked about open book management, um, the more information we can provide to employees so that they can see how, where the business is heading, how they impact that, can have a huge impact on employee engagement and morale. So they should know about their unit performance. They should have individual metrics that they can track. So many companies lack good metrics. How do you motivate employees when they don't even know how good of a job they're doing? I mean, how can I motivate people to achieve more if they don't even know what they're currently achieving? And there's so many companies that haven't implemented meaningful metrics that employees can use to see, you know, how they're, how well they're performing their job and how well it compares to others. Uh, safety information is really important to communicate. Environmental impact becoming a much bigger issue. We cannot just dump stuff anymore and expect our employees to be okay with it. And then corporate social responsibility, like I said before, is becoming huge uh, for many workers, not just the young ones, older ones too. Uh, knowledge, these are training programs. How can we train people to keep them engaged and motivated? Cross-training, like I said, I mean, I've, 
I've been in companies where we implemented programs that let office workers go out and do production jobs for a while. They thought it was awesome. I mean, and you're like, well, that doesn't make any sense. Why would they want to do that? Because they get tired of sitting at a desk. You know, if there's a production job, if there's some aspect of production that they can go out and safely perform and it's not going to mess up organizational performance, let them do it. What a great break from answering the phone all day to go out and make something. Um, and so I, I think cross-training programs are huge. Creates a lot of engagement, really helps motivate employees, may, helps them understand the business. I mean, in so many businesses, we've got all these people in the office who don't even really understand what the company does because they're so disconnected from the actual work that's being performed. Get them out of the field every once in a while so they know what, what's actually going on. Management training programs, you know, if we give people an opportunity to train for management positions instead of just, you know, deciding on our own that we're going to, you know, elevate a certain person, that can be really good. Uh, helping them develop better, better interpersonal skills. This can also reduce conflicts in the workplace, too, so I mean, there's a lot of benefits from this. But um, very helpful. And then, of course, professional skill development. One thing that some companies don't like about professional skill development is they're like, well, you know, I don't want to train somebody to go work for my competition. Well, you know, yeah, that's always a risk, but if you can do these other things right, they're not going to go to your competition. You know, they're going to want to work for you because you've made it a good place to work. And, of course, rewards. You know, we got to go beyond dollars per hour. Um, you know, a lot of companies would just like to do away with dollars per hour entirely and just pay people based upon output, but it's not really legal in most cases. So, um, but we've got to get direct beyond dollars per hour so people can see a relationship between what they do and organizational performance. So production incentives are common, quality incentives are common, suggestion programs tied to rewards are common, profit sharing is really good, but a lot of people don't do it, they should. Non-cash rewards, the additional time off is huge, it, it's, it's usually not a net increase in cost because usually someone can be out for a couple extra days without having to necessarily replace them. Just depends on your, your, your workforce. But the rewards are important, but, you know, we've got to make sure the rewards make sense. Uh, and then finally, I'm almost done, so if, if anybody does have any questions, please put them in. This is not a topic I expected a lot of questions on, so you will not hurt my feelings if you do not have a lot of questions because topics like this are not real question type uh, topics. So sustainability. Um, particularly when we look at millennials, people entering the workforce, they want to work for companies that are sustainable. And so one of the things that's really important to implement is sustainability programs in our organizations. And so that's something that, you know, we help companies with all the time. It doesn't have to be huge. You don't have to put in a million dollar solar panel program. There are small things that you can do that, to move towards sustainability and you'll find that a lot of workers really appreciate that. It can help you in recruiting. Uh, the other thing that can be really helpful and is something else that we help companies with are doing job satisfaction surveys. They have to be anonymous. You're not going to get good information on these if they're not anonymous. Um, it's usually good if it's conducted by an outside firm. When we do them for companies, we set up a, you know, a specialized web form where, where for most, sometimes we do paper depending upon the jobs, but usually we do it electronically now uh, where employees can go in and provide this input and then we go back to the company and talk about how we can use that to make changes in the organization. But it's good if somebody else is doing it so employees don't feel like they're going to be targeted based upon their responses. And it needs to be customized to the specific needs of the company. And we've got to do it again. You know, we've got to come back and see, okay, with these changes we've implemented, how did that, how did that change things? What do we do next? It's really constant improvement because the world is constantly changing. Job opportunities are constantly changing. If we're not constantly improving our work environment, then we're going to have a hard time retaining the best talent. So what are some of my best practices? Uh, I think that good CSR programs are a big deal. Make sure that our benefit packages align with employee expectations. Um, job flexibility, huge. Um, offer those sort of innovative benefits that, you know, have high perceived value but aren't necessarily real expensive. Um, give more frequent feedback to employees with, uh, you know, more frequent performance appraisals. And then we need to provide constant informal feedback so that they know where they stand and they feel like we're noticing, you know, not just the bad stuff but the good stuff as well. And try and make the work meaningful, you know. When people feel that their work is meaningful, it's easier to motivate them. And that's going to help us uh, make more money, which is what we're what we're trying to do as an organization. So that is the end of my
my presentation. And uh, if there are any questions, I'd be happy to answer them. But if there aren't any questions, that's okay too. All right. Thank you very much, Chris. Uh, we do have a couple questions. Uh, just before we get into those, uh, just a couple of reminders for those that may have jumped on uh, after the start of our presentation. Um, we will be sending out, uh, we're just waiting on uh, the HRCI credit. Um, so once we do receive that, we'll be sending that out to all attendees. Uh, so you can expect that probably uh, relatively shortly, and I would say in the next week at least. Um, the other thing is uh, people asked about uh, sl these slides and the recording. Will they be available? And they will be available on the Client Resource Center. Uh, we'll also include a link in the email when we send out for the HRCI credit. Um, now just getting into these questions here, we do have a couple. And again, if you do have any as we go along, feel free to enter them in the questions dialog box. Uh, the first question here, what do you suggest for small businesses with most people out in the field, very few people working within an office environment? I, you know, one of the things that can be really important in that kind of organization is to have reasons that you bring the team together that, that aren't just, you know, meetings. <laughs> um, one of the things that we find in those kind of organizations is that we often have uh, very low employee engagement. And because of that, we often have lower uh, motivation um, because people just, they feel very disconnected. They feel like they're out on their own. They're not really part of a team. They're not really seeing that, that the organization knows or cares about what they're doing. Um, in a small business, that's pretty easy to fix. You know, um, so we've, we've worked with companies where we created, you know, um, just social gatherings that, that, you know, every month there would be some sort of a, a get together that was part meeting, uh, usually followed by a meal or a meal first and then a meeting, or it was just entirely social in nature. Um, wasn't really expensive to implement, but it brought all those people together. And one of the things that they found is that when they brought all those people together who like hardly ever saw each other, they were able to share best practices, they were able to come up with ideas, there was more innovation occurring because they were bringing those people who were kind of operating autonomous, autonomously back together. Um, Good communication is one of the biggest things that helps um, employee engagement. And one of the things that we see in, in organizations where everybody's spread all over is that there's usually not, not great communication. It's, and it's not that people don't know what they're supposed to do, but you're not having that constant informal communication that leads to innovation and leads to high employee engagement. All right, thanks, Chris. Uh, the next question here, relative to cross-training and uh, slash allowing employees to trade jobs, um, the person says, work comp categories identify risk for specific jobs. How, sure. how do you explain uh, to your work comp carrier that your employee was working in a manufacturing position when the original classification was for a uh, clerical position? Well, it's, it's, well, so work comp is based upon the amount of payroll in the category, okay? So in most states, um, so long as, you know, now if your work comp company requires a physical or something like that, then yeah, that person would have to, you know, do whatever the requirements were. But in most states, as long as you're apportioning the appropriate amount of payroll to that classification, it is not, you can have individuals whose, whose payroll can be split in most states who can be split between more than one classification. So for example, we can have an employee who spends 80% of their time doing office clerical and 20% of their time doing something else. Um, if, it's, if it's for a really short period of time, you know, sometimes it's not going to be an issue at all. But in most states, you can, you can split out the payrolls and, and have a percentage uh, that's, that's doing that other task so that you're still in compliance uh, from a work comp standpoint by paying uh, having the right amount of payroll applied towards the um, that usually higher um, risk category for, for example, for a production job or something like that. If that's not possible, then you're going to have to look at other things that you can do. I mean, if, if you just can't do it, you can't do it. But in, in situations where we've seen companies uh, are able to do that, it has been something that has really helped employee engagement and helps kind of break up the monotony of, of just doing the same thing over and over again. You certainly aren't going to have a problem putting a production employee in the office, you know, because they're already in a, a more expensive uh, classification from a work comp standpoint. Um, but depending upon your state, but I would talk to your, your either your comp carrier or your 
property and casualty broker who handles your comp, because in many circumstances, either one, if it's just for a limited amount of time, they don't really care, um, or um, you can split out and just have a percentage of payroll for that individual be at that higher, higher category. All right, thank you, Chris. And that appears to be our final question of the day. So, uh, Chris, I appreciate your time, and everyone, I appreciate you for joining our uh, this webinar as well as all the webinars we've hosted in 2014. Uh, we have uh, a few lined up already in 2015. We're going to be finalizing the remaining schedule uh, very shortly. So, definitely take a look at the Client Resource Center, and we hope to see you on those webinars in 2015 as well. Thanks again, everyone again for joining us, and we look forward to talking to you again soon. Thanks.